Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Aggressive Intelligence. On this channel, we do many documentaries on black inventors and black businessmen and women who have had an impact on the world and our daily lives. These are the stories they won't teach you in school. In 1921, Fritz Pollard, a small but extremely quick running back, was recruited to coach the Akron Pros while he was still on the team. He was the only black head coach in the NFL at the time. The five foot nine Fritz was that good. Even those that laughed at him or did worse to black players couldn't help but applaud when he rushed for three 50 yard touchdowns in one game due to his speed and agility. Newspapers at the time applauded Fritz exceptional football intelligence and referred to him as a colored coach. At a period when hotels shunned him and restaurants refused to serve him, Fritz Pollard was both player and coach. He played and coached even though he wasn't permitted to get dressed with his team despite earning $1,500 per game as the highest paid player in the league. As the first black coach and one of the only two black players in the NFL, Fritz Pollard would either get ready in his vehicle outside the football field or head to a neighboring tobacco shop where the proprietor allowed him to use the back room. The reason being that they didn't want him in the locker room was because of the color of his skin. This is the story of Fritz Pollard. So sit back, relax, let's get into it. In 1894, Fritz Pollard, the seventh of eight children, was born in Chicago. His father was an African-American man who boxed competitively during the Civil War. His mother was of Native American descent. At Chicago's Lane Tech High School, Fritz competed in football, softball, and track. He then chose to major in chemistry at Brown University in Rhode Island. Only five foot nine and 150 pounds, Fritz Pollard played halfback for the Brown football team. In 1915, he helped the team defeat Yale and earn an invitation to the Tournament of Roses game in Pasadena, California. Fritz won the reluctant acceptance of his teammates at Brown University. In spite of losing to Washington State 14-0, Fritz made history by becoming the first African-American to participate in the Rose Bowl. In 1916, Fritz Pollard's outstanding performance helped Brown University to an 8-1 record, including victories over Yale and Harvard. Brown University was the first collegiate team to beat both Ivy League powerhouses in the same season. Dubbed the Human Torpedo, Fritz nearly defeated Yale and Harvard by himself. Fritz became the first African American to be inducted into the National College Football Hall of Fame in 1954. He was the first running back of African American descent to be selected for Walter Camp's All American team. Considered the father of American football, was an American collegiate football player teacher and sports journalist by the name of Walter Chauncey Camp. He invented many things, including the sports line of scrimmage and the down system. From his days as a Yale player until his passing, Camp served on different college football rules groups that helped shape the American game. Until they saw what he could do, his teammates really wouldn't talk to him or anything. What Fritz Pollard could do was rack up 60, 70, and 80 yards at a time. The rugged five foot nine halfback raced downfield as soon as he received the ball, his signature baggy football trousers flapping in the wind. Once they saw his talent, they were won over, and his personality also won them over. So from then on, they had his back no matter what. Fritz Pollard faced verbal harassment and worse because he was the only black person on the field. At the bottom of the pig pile during the college games in 1915, eye gouging, punching, and stomping were commonplace. Fritz was frequently the focus of the abuse. 
his teammates would help to defend him. He learned how to defend himself by rolling over and kicking his feet like a cat if somebody tried to pile on or drag their feet on him to cut him. His teammates would all wear baggy uniforms so that way no one could tell in the game who he was. And sometimes they even darkened their faces with shoe polish so the other team couldn't tell who he was. There was little Fritz's teammates could do to shield him from the obnoxious fans. These were Ivy League institutions that were still as prejudiced as any other in the nation. And he received death threats when they played certain schools in particular regions. The Yale's fans used to chant, Bye bye Blackbird, when he entered the field. There were times when he had to be escorted onto the field by the police. Brown University received a Rose Bowl invitation in 1916. The match on New Year's Day against Washington State University nearly didn't take place. The problem started in the team's hotel. They wouldn't let Fritz sign in. The entire team said, well, take us back to the train station because if you won't let him stay, we're all going back. The Brown football team threatened to return to Rhode Island if Fritz Pollard wasn't allowed to play. The hotel worked it out, meaning they let him stay after the team declined to stay. After graduating Brown University, he went on to coach the football team at the historically black Lincoln University for three years after serving in the Army at the end of World War I. Fritz Pollard criticized the school's administration, claiming they interfered with his ability to coach and had refused to provide the team with adequate travel accommodations. He explained to a reporter that the team had to travel to Hampton by boat before the game, sleeping on the decks, under portholes. He also criticized the school for not giving the team necessary equipment. No cabins were provided, nor were they given a place to sleep after reaching Hampton. They lost the game through a lack of rest. In 1920, the first season of the American Professional Football Association, the forerunner of the NFL, Fritz Pollard joined with the Akron Pros. He was one of two black athletes playing in the league. Fritz hardly ever left the game. There was nothing he didn't do during the game. He played quarterback. He was the running back. He did punt returns, kickoff returns, even the punts and kicks. Back then, they used to do the drop kick for the field goal. He did this as well. According to Aaron Dodson of ESPN, the undefeated, not everyone welcomed him into the professional ranks. And there were some players who simply didn't like the fact that this black guy was both a member of the league and the top player within it. I'd look at him and grin. Didn't get mad and want to fight him. Just look at him and grin. And the next minute, run 80 yards for a touchdown. He tested this out on a football icon before the Akron Pro's opening game against the dominant Canton Bulldogs. Jim Thorpe walked up to him and said, do you know who I am? And Fritz goes, yes, I know who you are. I've heard about you. And he goes, well, I've heard about you too. And he called Fritz the N-word. Fritz called him the N-word back. Thorpe simply took a step back and stared at him. He threatened to murder him and Fritz responded, well, if you're ready to kill me, you can find me down there in your end zone. Fritz then returned the opening kickoff for a touchdown, and Fritz waved for Jim Thorpe to come on. Fritz Pollard led his Akron team to an 8-3 season and the first pro football championship in the 1920s. When it was unusual for a black man to play football in a largely white environment, after the game, Thorpe said he was the best running back he had ever seen. Fritz Pollard was the first black person to play on a pro football championship team. One of the NFL's pioneers and potential Hall of Famers, George Halas, said he'd never play a team with an N-word on it again. Fritz Pollard was a significant attraction despite George Hollis's animosity 
or because of it. Some spectators came to watch him run, others to witness him being beaten. The league, which initially failed to contend with baseball, boxing, and horse racing, is credited by being saved by Fritz Pollard and Jim Thorpe. Fritz received a good salary as a result of his celebrity status. One guesstimate has him earning $1,500 per game. These days, that would be roughly $20,000. When Fritz was hired as Akron's coach in 1921, he made history as the league's first black head coach. He served as a player and a coach. He also became the first black quarterback in the NFL in 1923. Fritz Pollard, however, wasn't treated with the dignity he deserved. Unfortunately, he used to have to dress in his car. Can you picture your star player and coach having to dress in his car and then enter the field? It was evident in my first year at Akron back in 1919 that they didn't want blacks in there getting that money. And here I was playing and coaching and pulling down the highest salary in pro football. Fritz Pollard pro football playing career concluded in 1926. The following year, there were no African Americans in pro football. However, it is difficult to determine how effective a player Fritz Pollard was due to the unreliable and incomplete nature of data from the 1920s. In 1922, Fritz Pollard founded the first black-owned investment firm in the United States and later became a newspaper tycoon and a talent agent for numerous black performers, including Lena Horn and Fritz's old Akron pros colleague, Paul Robeson. Although Fritz was a successful businessman, he was inspired to take action when he saw a troubling trend in the NFL in the early 1930s. He took it upon himself to continue those opportunities for those black players who had demonstrated like himself that they were capable of playing in the National Football League at the highest level. In 1933, the league sort of enacted this gentleman's agreement that barred African-American players from the league. In response to this, Fritz formed a semi-pro team, the Brown Bombers a squad that included Paul Robeson and Mac Robinson, the older sibling of Jackie Robinson. They performed out of Harlem and were named after Joe Lewis. He really wanted them to show off their skills so that the NFL owners would be under duress to explain why black athletes weren't on those rosters and to let people know that they were playing really well. Compared to those white semi-pro teams, we are very competitive. Why aren't they giving black players the chance to participate in the National Football League? The Brown Bombers were 29-0 and and had never lost a game. They were beating some of the pro teams so badly that they had to hold the score down out of fear that the white teams wouldn't play them anymore. As a result, it was more than just an exhibition game because at the time, it was significant to have white players play black players. The Brown Bombers disbanded in 1938, becoming one of the Great Depression's many casualties. Fritz Pollard's team may or may not have exerted significant pressure on the NFL, but the league reintegrated in 1946. Jim Thorpe, George Preston Marshall, and George Halas who had resisted the hiring of black athletes in the NFL were among those inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame's first class in 1963. There is no question that Fritz Pollard should have been a member of the original class, and the majority of Hall of Famers agree that he ought to have been among the inaugural class. Fritz Pollard earned football's highest award in 2005, when he was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Fritz Pollard passed away at age 92 in 1986. Hey, you watched to the very end. We appreciate it, guys. Thanks for watching another episode of Aggressive Intelligence. 
see you in the next one.